you can turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter, 2 Peter, the first chapter, 2 Peter, the first chapter. I love Peter in this letter. It's an uh, important letter. Peter, before going to the cross, is going to write to the church, and, and there's some profound, impactful information in there. In fact, even in the first chapter, he starts off with that we are divine partaker, that we've been given precious promises through the cross that we can walk and look I'm paraphrasing a little bit now, but that we can look like Jesus. That he didn't just call us to save us to get to heaven one day, but that we can be a partaker of his nature and look like him even here on this earth. Well, after he says that, then he goes on to say, well, you've got to also do some things and develop some character. There's, there's some spiritual growth that needs to happen in your life. And so in 2 Peter, the first chapter, the fifth verse, it says this... Uh, I love that we have it on the screens. Everybody's just looking over there on it, ready for it to go. But also for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your uh, faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will uh, be neither barren nor unfruitful. Look at your neighbor and say, I don't want to be unfruitful. Look at your other neighbor and say, I want to be fruity. Oh, wait, wait, all right. <laughs> I'm thinking of fruity pebbles. Anyway, um, in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, for he who lacks these things is short-sighted even to blindness and has forgotten that he was cleansed from his old sins. Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and election sure. For if you do these things, you will never stumble. I remember uh, when I got into the military and uh, I, uh, I was, they were trying to teach me how to shoot. And finally, the drill sergeant said, like, I don't think it's your breathing. I, like, I think you got the, sque- you got the technique down. Uh, I think you can't see. You're blind. And so I had to go get my eyes checked, and I found out that, that I couldn't see long distance. To see, I, when I was in high, you know, growing up, they'd always have you get checked at school and things like that, and I had no issues with my seeing. But finally, when I got out and was in college and kind of out on my own, I never got my eyes checked. And I just, you know, I sat up closer and closer, but I didn't think much of it. I just, and I found out that, you know, now I can see. And, and the problem, I think, with a lot of us is we can't hit our targets because we're short-sighted. Like, like we, need, we need LASIK surgery. We need Jesus to come and, and speak to us. What is the, what is the reason I came? And, and Peter here says the short-sightedness is because you forgot what Jesus has cleansed you from. And I want to talk to church people today. I know we have some visitors and maybe you're not church. It, it, maybe you can grab some things still from this message. But I want to talk to people that you feel like you're a church person. You, you attend regularly. This is something you kind of do because we can miss the reason Jesus came if we just simply play church. We can have really good songs and really good music and the preaching, of course, is the best every Sunday. But... Uh, why do y'all laugh at that joke, but none of my other ones? <laughs> so, but we can, we can do church well, but if we are short-sighted and miss the reason Jesus came, we can lose, we can lose that vision, that purpose. And so I want to talk to you specifically about the purpose of why Jesus came. I want, to, I want to divide the church into two different categories. There's the false church, but the true church. And when I mean true church, a lot of people will preach this message. They talk more about uh, uh, church by doctrines, or they talk more about the styles of worship. Well, they, you know, this church has stained glass, so they're the true church. And, of course, we kind of crazy. But, you know, and, and so many people can associate style with true church. But if you, you know, if you have half a brain and read Romans 14, you'll understand that style has nothing to do with it. it it's, it's way more than doctrine. There's a purpose and intention of why Jesus came. And the true church will live towards that purpose. Can I get an amen, amen. over here? Awesome. Love you guys. I'm, I'm always picking on this side. I'm just letting y'all know so next time y'all probably... If I see some of y'all over on this side, I'll know I picked on y'all too much at that point. 
So my grandmother says I don't preach to this side enough. I preach to my right too much. So maybe because I'm right-handed. All right, uh, way too much information for a sermon. Stick on point. All right, so uh, I think we can find a symbolic picture of this in Luke the seventh chapter. Luke the seventh chapter, where a Pharisee named Simon invites Jesus over for a dinner. Now, when he invites him over for this dinner, you may not get what culturally is going on here, but this was like the big thing in the city. Uh, uh, the the Pharisee that was usually in charge of the local uh, uh, synagogue there, they would invite these upstart rabbis. And we sense from some of the implications of the passage that Simon really doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. He's probably trying to challenge Jesus' authority and show that he's not really following the law of Moses. And so people would gather around the city because, you know, they didn't have movie theaters. They would gather around. And so in essence, what's happening here is this is like a WWE SmackDown event. I mean, can you smell what I'm cooking right now, right? No rock fans. All right. Hulk Hogan rock. Can I get some generation to laugh with me? All right, so <laughs> some of you like you gotta go back to Andre the Giant for me. All right, <laughs> all right. So in the midst of this, Simon does none of the cultural cordialities in his day. Normally, when you came into a, a person's house to eat during this time period in this place, they would it. If they had, they would have one of their servants, usually the lowest servant on the totem pole, wash feet because of the dusty roads and all that was there. If they didn't have a servant to do it, bare minimum, bare minimum, they let, let out a basin of water, right? Just so people could clean their... Um, it's like this. If I invited you over to my house because I have four small kids, we are going to clean the half bathroom, right? In fact, it was so funny. We had a, a guest come over uh, uninvited, kind of un, uh, unexpected... Uh, I don't want to say uninvited, so they don't sh- always showing up on me. Unexpected, and my wife, before answering the door, is like, clean the half bathroom! Like, it was like, <laughs> we went into code red. <laughs> but <laughs> some people with kids understand what I'm talking about. Right? That's just a cultural thing that we have. Well, in Jesus' day, they left out a basin of water, and, and Simon didn't do that. And in fact, when they're eating at that table, he didn't do some of the others. Greet him with a kiss. He didn't leave out oil for Jesus to anoint himself. He's done nothing, probably because there's a bit of animosity. And in the midst of what's probably going to be a theological discussion, a woman barges in. Now, she is uninvited. And when she comes in, everybody's like, what's she doing here? Because this woman had a reputation. She was not from this side of town. And when she shows up, she immediately drops to Jesus' feet. I don't think she had a plan. She wasn't knowing exactly what she was doing. It was spontaneous. And when she sees Jesus' feet, now remember, they were supposed to be clean. But she sees these dirty feet. Now she brought oil to anoint them, but you can't anoint dirty feet. So her tears, as they're flowing out, begin to cleanse. And she lets down her hair. Now when she lets down her hair, there was probably an audible gasp in the room. Now you say, why was there an audible gasp? Because rabbis would write this, that a woman should only let down her hair when she's alone with her husband. Now she didn't mean it to be taboo or provocative. It was spontaneous and devotion in this moment though, everyone around is judging the situation and getting it wrong. And Simon, the host, even says within himself, he doesn't say it out loud, He's like most of us that stew on the inside. He's like, if this man truly was a prophet, he'd know what kind of woman is touching him. And of course, Jesus being more than a prophet, he is the prophet. He can read Simon's thoughts. And he says, Simon, I, I got to ask you a question. There was a, there was a money shark that lent out money, 500 denarii to one, 50 to another. They both couldn't pay him back, so he forgave both debts. Which one would love him more? Simon knows at this point. I mean, he's a Pharisee. He knows he's being spoken down to. He says, I I suppose it's the one with the larger debt. And then Jesus begins to illustrate all the ways the woman assisted him, showed devotion to him, and everywhere Simon was devoid of it. He says, 
You didn't leave out a water basin, yet her tears have just been cleansing my feet. You didn't greet me with a kiss, yet she hasn't stopped kissing my feet. You didn't even leave out oil, yet she's come prepared to anoint my feet with oil today. And here's, I think this is a prophetic picture of the church today. This is the split. It's not politics. It's not doctrine. It's not style of worship. The split today in the church, there's a church that has a Simon mentality where they're all, they're all about holiness at the expense of people. And they don't realize they're not even reaching what they're trying to reach because it cannot be reached without Jesus. And then there's the true church where they realize there's a call after people and to reach the loss. And like Peter wrote, they realize they've been forgiven of so much. They can't help but extend it out to other people. And so I want to I want to pick out three identifying. I was going to give four, but my name's Trey, and y'all start looking at me cross-eyed when it gets to about twelve fifty. So, um, so we went three. I say twelve fifty. Usually it's twelve thirty. Then I start getting looks like, don't you know the Baptists let out right now? We are trying to beat them to Golden Corral. I mean, come on. <laughs> Nobody's laughing at my jokes at the eleven. 9 a.m., they have so much coffee, they laugh at everything. <laughs> My wife says, stop separating the services. Treat it all as one church. So I love every one of you. Y'all are amazing. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Oh, no, uh, side note, so let's get back to the, to the sermon. All right, so I want to give three identifying factors, three identifying factors of what the true church looks like, what they have operating in their life. The first thing... Notice this, that she cleanses his feet with her tears. Ephesians 5, the 26th verse says this, that the church will be cleansed by the washing of the water of the Word. The Word of God is what cleanses our hearts. The identifying factor of the true church is they're not going to talk about what mama said or what the pastor said. They're going to be in the Word of God for themselves, feeding themselves on that Word, learning that Word. And what they'll discover about that Word is it's not only cleansing them, but it's providing forgiveness for others. What I have discovered when I've read the Word of God with with a true lens is that there's some that see it from a law book and then there's others that see it as a love letter. And when I became, got to know Jesus, I started seeing it as a love letter. That he's forgiven me of everything I've ever done. And in this place, it begins to renew my mind. Uh, I had somebody tell me, they said, you need to, especially when I first rededicated my life, they said, you need to stop going to church. It, they're brainwashing you. And I said, my brain needed a good washing. Do you know the, all the thoughts that I had? Like it was junk in and junk out. And I just was selfish all the time. And I needed the word of God to come and cleanse me and wash me. And now when I get a thought, I don't have to own it. I can take it captive and say, you know what? God's word doesn't say that. That's why I love uh, 2 Corinthians, the 10th chapter. It says this in the third verse. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to to the flesh. That's now notice that. Churches that are dividing, they want you to think it's all about a division of people. It's not a war of the flesh. The enemy is trying to divide us. Stop being so divided over doctrine. Let's just celebrate Jesus and love people. I, I had uh, uh, what I love because it reminded me of the disciples arguing to Jesus. They came to Jesus. We heard them casting uh, devils out in your name, Jesus. We told them to stop. And he's like, if they ain't against us, they're for us. I had somebody come to me and said, they don't go to our church and they're wearing that Jesus shirt. And I got all excited. They're like, no, they're supposed to, they got to come here. I was like, no, they don't. That's why we just put Jesus on the shirt. If it was about our church, we would have put Church of the Living God on it. Right? It's about him. So we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. 
So not only does the word clean you, but it allows you to take every thought captive. So you're going to capture thoughts. Is this thought of me? Is this thought of the enemy? Or is this thought of God? You only understand that when you're in the Word. When the Word of God is prevalent. If you're getting your head washed in Netflix... I watched a TV series on Amazon Prime, and it was, it was good. Uh, I normally don't watch TV series because it's a lot of time commitment. I, I like movies, and I even found out on YouTube they do recap movies where they put the movie in 12 minutes. And you can also put YouTube on 1.5 speed, so you can get that whole thing in 8 minutes. And I'm like, yes, Jesus. It's amazing. Watch a movie in 8 minutes and get rid of all the bad parts and slow parts. And so... Um, so I'm committed to this TV series, and uh, I'm watching it, and it's good, it's entertaining, but at the end of the day, after watching it all, the Word of God's coming to me, and it's saying, because it, it, it was about revenge, but revenge that was justified. And the Word of God's coming to me and saying, a man's anger does not produce the righteousness of God. Amen. You know, and if I'm allowing that to be my guide then when I have an argument with my wife, I'm going to be okay with the revenge because the movie said it was okay. I mean, we argued on the way over here trying to get to work, you know. I mean, uh, church, it is work. But uh, it's funny. We, uh, we're out, usually we're like three minutes away, and right now we're staying at my grandfather's house, and it's a 30-minute drive from Texas City. And, like, the devil jumps in the car. I'm, I mean, I'm, I need to pray more for my spouses, right? Five-minute ride, it's easy to be spiritual. 30-minute ride, whoo, Jesus, help me. That's too much a confessional for you guys today, huh? Now, if I don't allow the Word to renew me, I'm giving her the silent treatment on the way over here instead of asking her to forgive me. Right? That's petty. Arguing over the ace. You know, I'm not trying to act all spiritual and then preach a sermon here. Instead, the Lord's saying, hey, how about you ask her to forgive you and tell her you were wrong? Tell her it's her car. I mean, the Honda's her car, right? <laughs> minivan. The key is her car, too. She can have them both. I don't care. They're minivans. Who cares? So, <laughs> so you're allowing every thought to be taken captive. You're not, your enemy is not your spouse, it's not your coworker. it's not your boss. You understand that the enemy is these thoughts that are coming across trying to get you to make a wrong decision. But you won't know that unless you're in the Word. If you think this Sunday message where I drop three scriptures on you is enough to eat for the week, you're going to be starved spiritually. And then you're going to struggle and you're going to ask me, why isn't the Word working for me? Because you're not in it. And so you can't determine what God's direction is for your life. You don't know what His destiny is because you haven't been transformed yet. That's why the Bible says in Romans 12, and do not be conformed to Netflix. <laughs> hey, why does he pick on Netflix all the time? Because that's... A, I don't even have Netflix. I have Amazon Prime. But either way, but be transformed. How do you transform your heart? By renewing your mind that you may prove what is the good, the acceptable, the perfect will of God. So many people come to me and say, Pastor, what does the Lord want me to do? Get in the Word. Then you'll know. Then you'll be able to determine His will. So many... Like, I think one of the biggest tricks of the enemy is he tries to get you to define God's love by circumstance. So you'll ask the wrong questions and you don't think anything about it because you're not in the Word. Like, you'll be like... Well, God loved me. Why did I have to go through that? Or why did I go through this? And it, what it shows is you've never actually read the word where it says God's love is not defined by circumstance. It's defined by the cross. Ooh, I feel silence up in this church. Y'all should know this. Right? It doesn't say for God so loved the world, you're going to have a good day. It says for God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. It says in Romans the fifth chapter, when you were an enemy to God, that he demonstrates his love, not by you having a good day, by nobody dying, by you not having a divorce, by you not going bankrupt. He doesn't say all those things. He says God demonstrates his love by sending his son. So when you're in the word, you start to realize it and you'll ask the right questions 
Because my second point, you'll start to know him. Another identifying fact of the church, or identifying factor of the church, is you will know him. I was uh, my b- daughter's birthday was yesterday, and we went out to H E B to get uh, her birthday meal, and we're rolling by the steak aisle. I like steaks. I don't know about you, but I like steaks. And I'm like, Alethea, you want you want a steak for your birthday? And Sophia, my second oldest daughter, said, If you knew Alethea, you wouldn't even ask that question. That's Sophia, man. I know Sophia. That's her. And, and why is that? Well, one, my daughter doesn't like uh, steaks. But, but realize this, that when you get to know God, you're going you're gonna to stop asking the wrong questions in your prayer. Call. Some of us, we wonder why we feel like God's not answering because we're asking the wrong questions. But when you, get to, when you humbly submit yourself and get to know Him, what happens is... He begins to father you, your heart, so that you know what to ask and when to ask. You know the protocol that He's seeking from you. It doesn't mean you have to have everything right all the time. What it means is there's this sincerity of seeking Him that He'll respond to. Uh, Hebrews, the 11th chapter. I wanted to give another example, but I think I gave it last week where if I went up to my grandfather and I said, I call him Papa, but if I said, hey, Bobby, what's up? He's... He's probably going to look at me a little strange, right? Okay, bad example. Hebrews, the 11th chapter, the 6th verse. (laughs) But without faith, it is impossible to please Him. For those who come to God must believe that He is and that He's a rewarder of those that diligently seek Him. If we notice with this woman, she consistently was kissing His feet. And what, what I find with true believers is there's a true intimacy with Jesus. They don't talk about God. They don't talk about the scriptures as if it's not personal. They talk about God as if they have a personal relationship and encounter with Him every day. And that's what I discover. I don't care about your extra Jesus. Extra Jesus. I took seminary enough to know that word and the joke that goes with it. Um, Right? I think doctrine's important. I think we should study the scriptures. But the Pharisees could quote the Scriptures forward and backwards. They not only could quote the Scriptures, they could quote all the rabbis, the main prevailing rabbis' thoughts on those Scriptures and give you their thought on it. They were very learned people. Yet when Jesus shows up, they don't know who He is. And you can know the Scriptures very well, and I want you to. But yet I don't want you to not know Jesus in the midst of it. There needs to be a relationship. There needs to be an encounter. How does that happen? Prayer and fasting. We need to seek the Lord consistently, often. Uh, in the church it says, uh, um, when you, or if you sin and when you fast. But for some reason in, our, in the church today in America, we say when you sin and if you fast. We should reverse those. That fasting should be something that we're doing consistently and often. This is what I found in my own life when I was a pastor. And I just gave, I'll just tell you my thing, it's not impressive at all. In 2016, I offered Jesus a Monday every week. And some of those I failed miserably. Kid was waving a cheese stick in my face at 10 a.m. I didn't make it to 10 a.m., my friends. I didn't condemn myself. I just went back at, at, at it the next Monday. And I consistently did it over and over. With my fishes and loaves. With my zero spirituality. Some of y'all are 40 dayers and y'all are like, Jesus showed up on that? With that, he showed up and began to speak to me. And those intimate words he spoke to me changed the course of my destiny. But not because... He said, I'm calling you to do all these things. He had already told me those things. No, he began to change the character within me to reach the place he had called me to. See, because I always thought it was about me achieving some great thing in ministry. I didn't realize that he was going to change my character so that I stopped worrying about getting to somewhere and I started helping others get to where God had called them. And when I, got my, when I got myself off my mind and I started just helping out 
everybody I could and speaking destiny over them. It's funny, that was our waiter's name, Destiny. It was so cool. We, uh, man, I'm giving y'all way too many side comments. This, this sermon is going to get distracted. We went to Gringo's because uh, uh, we're in Texas City right now. And we're like, let's go to Gringo's. And, of course, the kids love it because you get ice cream, right? And they eat ice cream before and after because you got a wait list. There's like, and Dad's like, sure, why not, you know? But we get our waiter destiny, and and I'm praying. I, I get our kids around. I'm like, what does the Lord want to speak to our waiter? I tip her crazy, like crazy. Trey before, even when I love Jesus, wasn't doing that. Why? Because I'm cheap. I'm you know I'm struggling just to go out to eat, like. But the Lord changes my heart. And he says it's about reaching people. That happens in intimacy because you're going to begin. What happens is this. We don't just love God because we're good people. We begin to see his love and we reflect it back to him. In the midst of loving him, he's going to begin to ask you to love other people. And you're going to be like, oh, Lord, I'm not sure about that one. Really, that one over there? But when you get his heart, he molds that heart in you through intimacy you're going to want to go after the people that you wouldn't want to talk to normally. That's a sign of the true church. Notice, Simon was all about discussing theology with Jesus. The sinful woman, she was all about anointing Him. Last point. Sign of the true church, they will have the anointing. The anointing. I talk to Denzel about this all the time. I say, Denzel, you got a great gift. It's awesome how you sing. Like, the Lord, I mean, when I hear you sing, I'm like, man, angels showed up, bro. You can, can I get an amen on that? Amen. You got melody. I mean, like, when they sing together, I'm like, what happened? Did Jesus show up here today? You know? But I always tell them the difference between a gift and the anointing is the difference between a concert and people getting saved, healed, and delivered. If it's just a concert, we clap and go home, and that was a good song. But if it's the anointing, then something happens in our midst that breaks the yoke. See, the anointing is powerful, my friends. The anointing is where the Spirit of God shows up. It's the the differentiator between... Uh, you just go into your job and doing good because you've got gifts in it. I'm, well, I'm an accountant. I'm good at math. That's just natural knack for me. Or you have an, the anointing with you and you're able to discover ideas and inventions and see things that couldn't be seen there before. That's because the Spirit of God is there. That happens with the anointing. Now, I need you to hear me clearly. The gifts and callings of God are without repentance. God doesn't change his mind. He ain't taking his gift back from you. If he's called you to do something, he ain't going to be like, nah, I called the wrong person. He doesn't do that. But the anointing could not be there because you'd never followed after him. I look at Samson. I think one of the saddest moments in Scripture, it says he did not know the Spirit of God had left him. See, it's the Spirit of God that actually changes and breaks the yoke. Uh, I remember... Uh, 2016, it was an Easter message. And if you know anything about my Easter messages, those are the, that's the cupcake message that I give. Like it's just rainbows and sunshines and I tell a lot of stories and I talk a lot about God's salvation. Jesus told me to do it. Like he told me 2012, he said, I want you to preach a soft message, tell them how much I love them, tell them how, tell them how valuable they are and tell them what I was willing to do to get them out of bondage. And so I preach that message. It's a simple message tell a lot of funny stories. It's usually better than how this message is going today. And um, thank you, Joe, for laughing at my jokes. Somebody. But I, I, that, that's my message. 2016, I have a, a wife, she said, or a woman come, and she says, I'm bringing my husband. And I said, praise God. would love to have your husband come to the service. And in 2016, I was singing. I was doing a lot, man. Praise the Lord. Thank you for Denzel and Ben and the whole team. But I was singing, and I noticed fifth song. He wasn't, they weren't, both of them weren't here. And finally, right at the end, before, uh, in the music, she drug her husband in here. And I'm like, oh, go good. He made it. 
And so I get up and I preach that cupcake, rainbow and ponies message, man. And uh, Joe Lowstein to the max, as best as I can do it, right? <laughs> and so as I'm preaching this message, I don't think anything of it. But the next Sunday, he comes back again. And then the next Sunday, then the next Sunday, then the next Sunday. And he just keeps coming. And then four months down the line, he pulls me into the office and his whole family says, we're going to be going to Florida. Can you pray for our move? But before you pray, Pastor, i got to tell you my testimony. See, my, my wife, uh, uh, she drugged me to the Easter message. I was high on drugs that day. So he was high on drugs when he was listening to my Easter message. He says, but when I heard the word preached, I have never done drugs again. Now explain that to me. Because I'm just telling words and jokes. Explain to me the foolishness of preaching, the sacredness of me just expounding on the word of God and it changing somebody's life. Scientifically, nothing should happen. Not that. Not that. What happened? It was the anointing. Amen. See, we need the Spirit of God in everything we do. Amen. And He shows up and He's in relationship with us as we become holy. He's a, his name's the Holy Spirit for a reason, right? Amen. But you don't become holy by looking at yourself and trying to do all the right things. You become holy by beholding the Holy One. And as you gaze upon the Lord, your life will begin to change and the anointing will be there for the things you need. And in, the, in these last days, the church needs the anointing. And what I found with my own life is that when I have come close to the Lord and sought after Him, He has changed my life in such a way that I desire to seek after people. And there is, there, there is a church, a false church like Simon, that they are all about talking about holiness at the expense of people. And then there's the true church that says, we're just going to go encounter Jesus and let the chips fall where they may. The wheat and tear grow together and we're going to let the Lord work. Man, I feel like preaching today. Have I started yet? I got that. Okay, let me give you, uh, I'll end on this story because this, is, this was the thing that set me on the path I was on. I'm a church kid, if I can say that. I'm the grandson of a pastor. Like, all I know is church. I mean, we were eat, eating at Chick-fil-A yesterday, and they were playing Amy Grant, and... I was like, that's Amy Grant. My wife's like, are you sure that's Amy Grant? Like, I, heard, I think I heard that second. I'm like, no, that's Amy. Like, I know. And we Google it, Amy Grant. Like, I'm like, because that's all I grew up listening. In fact, sometimes I'll sing some of these popular uh, hook songs because I only know the chorus. I never grew. I just didn't listen to much secular music growing up. Like, I'll sing, you know, Slim Shady or something. My name is. And my wife's like, because she knows every line and lyric. And she's like, don't sing that song, you know. And I don't know any, like, I just... My name is, that's all I know. And then I'll put Trey in there, just make it fun. And so, um, so the pure, all things are pure. So, I, like, but that's my life. I just grew up very churchy. And uh, there were some disappointments that happened in my life. My dad, uh, our parents got a divorce uh, through some decisions that my dad had made. Uh, my grandmother, my grandfather's first wife, passed away from brain cancer. And so in high school, all these things are happening. And I began, because I define God's love by circumstance. So that deception, that lie bound me. And I began to stray away from the Lord. Now, not outwardly. Again, I was at church. My mom drugged me to church Sundays and Wednesdays. You say, why are you plural on Sundays? There was a Sunday morning and Sunday night when I was growing up, right? 80s, it was a two-hour message. 90s, hour and a half. And that, y'all balk at 40 minutes. I mean, like... I'm talking about the sermon, not the service. The sermon was an hour and a half, right? In the 80s, they just let you sleep on the, on the chairs as a kid. The no children's ministry. You just had to suffer for Jesus. And so... <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I grew up, and I began to stray away. And in 2001, I say I'm going off the deep end. And I, I do 
all the sins that I think, you know, I used to list it all out, but it, I don't think it's beneficial. And, and somebody invites their friend and they're like, you go to church with a pastor? That guy's jacked up. So I just don't list it anymore. But I had all my sins, all my struggles. And in 2001, 9-11, uh, 9-11 had happened. And I was a door-to-door salesman. And, and I was on full commission. And so in, in 9-11, nobody would open their doors. There was fear across the land. And so I'm struggling now to pay rent. And so in the midst of my struggle to pay rent, my dad had been inviting me to church. My mom had been praying for me. I said, you know what? If I go back to God and rededicate my life, he'll pay my bills. Now, I want you to know, I've listened to a lot of, you know, Simon preachers, and they would say, there's no way God's accepting you back. You're trying to treat him like your sugar daddy. Your motive's off. Like, he ain't going, he, he's not taking you back. And, and I'm here to tell you that I went back based on that motive. And you would have thought, God, God been like, dude, I saved you at five years old. You were full of the Holy Ghost and speaking in tongues at eight. And now you're going to try to come back to beg and come back to me just so I can pay your bills? That's how we preach God a lot of times. And yet God took me back. And, and at Lakewood Church, of all the, you know, Joel Osteen, the guy you make fun of, that was the guy that put my, my feet on the right path. Praise God for him. Some of y'all struggling with clap. You're like, I can't clap. I've made fun of him too much. You may want to watch your judgments. I'm just saying. Maybe the preachers you're listening to are a part of that church Simon I'm talking about. So in the midst of this, God takes me back. And in fact, that next weekend, I sell three water softeners. I only needed two for the month. I, you, I never sold three in one weekend. I sell three in one weekend. The Lord shows up. I'm able to pay my bills. He takes me back. He accepts me. And He reached me, listen, He reached me right where I was at. Did he grow me? Do I, have, do I have better motives today? Yeah, hopefully my motives are a little bit better and I love God authentically and I'm learning how to die to self. But he reached me right where I was at. And what it taught me is I need to reach people right where they're at. Maybe hold off my judgments and let God do his work in them. Because I really didn't get a hold of the selfless gospel till Dan Moeller which was like 2016. That's 2001. 15 years? Lord, I mean, I guess I could have got on board a little earlier. but uh, And I'm still growing in this beautiful gospel. So I say all of that because this church was founded on the idea of reaching the lost. My grandfather, who they labeled the gypsy preacher because he didn't fit in the stained glass churches, his was a tent, was reaching the junk mans and the steamboat Flemings and the fishing families out here that nobody, when, when the West was just the wild West. He was out here reaching the hippies. Wasn't, wasn't the hippies in the 70s? Jesus movement? Yeah. And that's our heart. That's the heart of this church. That We've gotten really good at doing church. Really good at it. Amen? Can I get it? Some of you are like, oh, the sermon. But, okay, the other part. We're really good at that part. Children's ministry, greeting, uh, music. We're really good at the doing church part. But what about becoming her? And becoming her is reaching the lost. Amen? Amen. 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 We all bow our heads together today. Oh, Father. I never want to close a service without giving you an opportunity to know Him. I talked to you about my life, how He saved me from my sins. He took me back right where I was. My reason to come back was, God, can you pay my bills? And He didn't judge me. He didn't condemn me. 
Say, come on home, son. And I don't know where you're at today. Maybe you find yourself in that same position. Maybe you just snuck in today. Maybe you've been deep in sin. Or maybe you've never made a commitment to this guy named Jesus. I want you to know he's, he's here for you today. It's through a simple yes that your life can be changed. I'm not talking about being perfect. I'm talking about this progression. I, I, I gave you my story. I was not perfect. I wasn't even perfect after the prayer. But I started to grow. That seed hit my heart. And I started to become different. If that's you today, you want to say yes to God for a first time or you want to rededicate your life today. You're tired of living for yourself. You're tired of sin. You want a brand new beginning. Just want you to raise your hand high in there. I want to pray with you today. Is there anyone? Amen. Amen. See those hands. Yeah, so good. Jesus is all about people. It's all about people. Oh, Jesus. Never let us lose sight of the lost. Let us love people, God. Father, for those that have been callous through disappointments and offense, Father, I pray that you would soften their heart today. Remind them of what they were saved from. Father, for those that lifted their hands today, Father, I pray that you would forgive them of everything they've ever done. Wash them clean through the blood of the Lamb. Jesus, we believe you died on the cross for us and you rose again. And you're seated at the right hand of the Father. And God, you're more than a God now. You're our Father. Teach us and guide us. Holy Spirit, fill us right now. Make us brand new on the inside. Holy, blameless, and above reproach. In Jesus' name I pray. And the people of God said, Amen, amen. If you said that simple prayer with me, you are brand new in the kingdom of God. Old things have passed away. All things are new. I want to just tell you two words today. Welcome home. Welcome home. You're in the family of God.